okay a 60 year old female patient presents with complaints of pain and swelling in the left wrist following fall on outstretched hand that's the most important thing fall on outstretched hand on examination a dinner fork deformity is noticed the question he is asking is what is the most likely displacement seen in this patient he is asking what is the displacement responsible for the dinner fork deformity so he is checking as whether we have read the six classical displacements that happen in Coley's fracture only when we know the six displacements only when we when we neutralize the six displacement we can treat Coley's fracture. We all know, dear friends, the treatment of choice for Coley's fracture is conservative. That is POP. What we say is a Coley's cast. What we say is a Coley's cast. Okay. So, to give a Coley's cast, you should be, definitely, we should be very thorough with the six displacements. Only when we contract, when we neutralize the six displacements, we can treat Coley's fracture. We can treat Coley's fracture. Okay right is <coughs> um, the choices given are jagan ad off paniringa just you off the cell because battery because you just in your cell proximal and ventral displacement of the radius proximal and dorsal displacement of the radius proximal and dorsal displacement of the ulna proximal and ventral displacement of the ulna okay four things the classical answer, the, the answer is proximal and dorsal displacement of the radius is the, the cause for dinner folk deformity. Okay, now let us see the six displacements of colis. Six classical displacements of colis. There are six components, six displacements of colis. Okay, so, and we just in our main recording also. The classical mnemonic which we follow is DILS, D-I-L-S, DILS. Very simple, dear friends. Number one, dorsal tilt. Dorsal tilt. Dorsal displacement. The third thing is impaction. Fourth thing is lateral tilt, lateral displacement, finally it is supination, finally it is supination, okay, so Dorsal tilt, dorsal displacement, impaction, lateral tilt, lateral displacement, supination. These are the six components or displacements of Coley's fracture. Okay. All these things, dear friends, we know whenever there is a fracture, there is something called proximal fragment, something called distal fragment. Proximal fragment, distal fragment. All these displacements are in regards with only the distal fragment, not the proximal fragment. Where the distal fragment is situated, how it is displaced that is called the dorsal tilt means distal fragment is tilt dorsally dorsal displacement distal fragment is displaced dorsally distal fragment is impacted distal fragment is supinated so everything in relationship with the distal fragment okay now we all know what is Coley's cast why this question is clinically so important we all know what is Coley's cast Coley's cast is a below elbow pop cast given in palmar flexion ulnar deviation because this time this may be the question this may be the question what is a colis cast what is the position held in a colis cast it is below elbow pop cast in full palmar flexion ulnar deviation okay whenever before applying any cast for any fracture what a person will stand here he will give counter traction or the patient will give a traction we will reduce so first thing what we give is a traction once we are given a traction we are making the wrist we are flexing the wrist palmarly we are deviating the hand in ulnar direction so palmar flexion ulnar in this position we are immobilizing <coughs> with a below elbow pop cast and that is called a colis cast and in this position the upper limb will be there for six to eight weeks and the fracture will heal very well 
okay when you see this when you give traction impaction is neutralized when you do a palmar flexion the dorsal tilt and dorsal displacement is neutralized okay then you, when you do ulnar deviation the lateral tilt and lateral displacement is neutralized and the pop is usually the forearm is kept in full pronation okay so this is supination this is pronation so pop is kept in full pronation you are keeping in full pronation the supination is neutralized this is called the colis cast so what is colis cast a below elbow pop cast in palmar flexion ulnar deviation in full pronation okay that's called colis cast so that's all in and around they can ask only this question so a very simple question dinner folk see the classical dinner folk deformity you see the distal fragment this is the distal fragment so distal fragment is displaced there is a dorsal tilt and dorsal displacement that is the reason for dinner folk deformity if instead of dorsal tilt and dorsal displacement instead of that uh, the patient had fallen on with outstretched hand the patient is having a ventral tilt and ventral displacement that is not called coli's fracture that is called reverse coli otherwise called smith fracture otherwise called a smith fracture okay in smith fracture there will be ventral tilt and ventral displacement okay you'll move on to the next question you see <coughs> again as i said concentrate on age of the individual in the question sex of the individual because this is the clinically based era dear friends okay so age and sex itself will give us some diagnosis in orthopedics you see a 17 year old boy 17 years boy okay presented to the clinic with the chief complaints of painless lump on the medial aspect of the right knee painless lump on medial aspect of the right knee okay so the area involved is around knee joint radiograph of the patient shows below which are the following the most likely diagnosis he is asking us to check the x-ray see i am able to see a femur a tibia a fibula in the in this area of the femur i am seeing a growth which is going outwards like this okay it is going with it has a pedicle going outward like this the area that is affected is metaphysis the area that is affected is metaphysis so this is in the femur in the metaphysis and the growth is outside the cortex obviously a male a boy patient if it's a male and age is a growing age 17 teenage growing pubertal age it's growing age definitely obviously this should be exostosis this should be exostosis exostosis is other is called osteochondroma so the right answer is osteochondroma osteochondroma is other is called exostosis okay so we all know about so before going to this note dear friends just a, a thing from us request from us if you are seeing for the first time kindly subscribe our channel you are seeing it regularly if you like our video please stick, give a, a likes and share it okay right thank you so much so you see this is osteochondroma otherwise called exostosis and let us see what are the mcqs that can be asked in the topic exostosis most common benign bone tumor first point one lakh time repeated mcq dear friends various entrances one lakh time repeated entrances. whenever somebody is asking about osteochondroma the first thing that will come to the examiner's mind is the most common benign bone tumor number two it is an offshoot from the spongy bone tissue covered with a cartilaginous cap that is why the word chondroma chondro means cartilage osteochondroma that is why whenever you see dear friends you see here i will show you here you are seeing a growth to this size this is the size in the x-ray x-ray will show you only the bony tissue x-ray can't show you the cartilaginous cap that is why this is a bony outgrowth covered by a cartilaginous cap covered by a cartilaginous cap a practical thing i am telling you dear friends whenever you see an x-ray of exostosis it will appear very small comparatively smaller but on table when you put an incision you want to you are, you are removing it no it will appear bigger because the cartilaginous cap x-ray won't show you so always 
on table the size of the tumor will be bigger than the radiological appearance this is a very practical point okay you see that's why it is an offshoot from the spongy bone tissue covered with a cartilaginous cap and aptly uses a word when you read aptly's textbook of system of orthopedics he says that why uh, this exhaustosis is happening only in few children, not in other children. It's happening only. This is due to perverted activity of the cambium layer of the periosteum. That's the word in the textbook. Perverted activity of the cambium layer of the periosteum. We all know the cambium layer is very important for growth. So unwanted activity of the cambium layer of the periosteum. That is the basic pathogenesis why exhaustosis is happening in some children. Right? Good. And most common age, it is growth period. It has a male preponderance and if it's a bone tumor, again, the point you should know where it is originating from the epiphysis, metaphysis or diaphysis. Osteochondroma or exhaustosis arises from metaphysis. Osteoid osteoma, diaphysis. Chondroblastoma, epiphysis. Chondroblastoma, epiphysis. Osteogenic sarcoma, metaphysis. Ewing's sarcoma, diaphysis. Giant cell tumor, epiphysis. These things we should know. We should know. These are all straightforward, simple questions which will raise our mark like anything. Okay, so most common is male and it's a metaphysial tumor. Okay, yes. Usually symptomless. Okay, 99% Patient will, it is totally symptomless. That is why he, in the history, he said painless. That's the word. Suppose pain happens in osteochondroma. It can be of three important, four important reasons, dear friends. Number one, adventitious bursitis of the osteochondroma. Bursitis has happened. It will cause pain. Number two, fracture of the osteochondroma. Number three, malignant change in the osteochondroma. Number four, when osteochondroma compresses the nerves, neurological pain. Four causes for pain. Osteochondroma per se should not cause pain. When pain arises in osteochondroma, these four causes, one should rule out. Okay. Yes. And appearance of the exhaustosis, the grass appearance is called cauliflower appearance. And coming to treatment of choice of osteochondroma, the best treatment, no, it is excision is the treatment of choice excision is the treatment of choice you have to excise it completely send it for biopsy because dear friends excision with wall cauterization dear friends this is a precancerous condition osteochondroma has malignant potential it's a pre-malignant tumor so always send it for biopsy confirm it's only benign okay so excision is the treatment of choice we'll move on to the next question <clears throat> they had given a picture, obvious picture, classically it is showing a classical deformity and he is asking, an elderly patient was brought to the outpatient department with the following deformity, what is the most probable diagnosis? That's the question, obviously a hand, a picture, elderly hand is shown and the distal interphalangeal joint is showing a deformity like this flexion of the distal interphalangeal joint with hyperextension of the proximal interphalangeal joint, a deformity like this. This, this is classically called a swan neck deformity. This is classically called a swan neck deformity. And by this time, you would have guessed what swan neck deformity. The answer definitely it's not rickets, it's not osteomalacia, it's not osteoarthritis. The answer is rheumatoid arthritis because. What is the pathology an osteoarthritis can cause in the distal interphalangeal joint? It can cause a nodule. And that nodule of distal interphalangeal joint is called Herbadens nodule. Osteoarthritis, the nodule caused by osteoarthritis in the distal interphalangeal joint is called Herbadens nodule. The nodule that is caused in proximal interphalangeal joint is called Bouchard's nodule. So nodules can be seen in osteoarthritis, not deformity like this. Okay, So this is a classical swan neck deformity. By the by, side by side, let us just revise what are the typical deformities that can happen in rheumatoid arthritis. Number one, swan neck deformity. It is flexion of the distal interphalangeal joint. Number two, botanius deformity. This botanius deformity is otherwise called buttonhole. This is otherwise called buttonhole deformity. Botanius deformity is otherwise called a buttonhole deformity. It can cause a hitchhiker's thumb. 
it hitchhikers deformity then it in the hand it can cause a z deformity it can cause a z deformity what do you mean by z deformity just i'll show you the metacarpophalangeal joint will move towards one direction there will be ulnar deviation of the metacarpophalangeal joint okay and there will be radial deviation of the proximal interphalangeal joint exactly it will look like an z so it's called z deformity ulnar deviation of the metacarpophalangeal joint with radial deviation of the proximal or uh, interphalangeal joint that's called z deformity sometimes no this z deformity in some books olden books i had read this ulnar deviation of the metacarpophalangeal joint is called piano key hand this other is called a piano key hand like a piano player playing no how they will keep on the keyboard like this no so it's called ulnar deviation and spread out fingers like this okay it's called a piano key hand okay is it deformity it is called a piano key hand okay right so these are various deformity names otherwise you can expect what's called a main and lonetti deformity it's called telescopic fingers telescoping fingers whenever you read telescoping fingers this is an additional point dear friends i'm telling this is an mcq class i'm telling you telescopic fingers two things should cross your mind in orthopedics number one rheumatoid arthritis number two psoriatic arthritis psoriatic arthritis okay one is rheumatoid arthritis number two psoriatic arthritis two causes are recorded in our textbook for telescopic fingers okay yes then the patient in the lower limb can have a classical wind swept deformity wind swept deformity what do you mean by wind swept deformity one for example left knee joint will be having a genu valgum right knee joint may be having a genu varum exactly like a, as if swept in, in by a wind in one direction i'll show you the pictures i'll show you pictures then in lower limb spread out toes they are called torch light deformity then this is one place i had read to my in my medical knowledge i had never read anywhere else sudden onset flat foot patient will be having normal arch curvature of the foot sudden onset flat foot rule out rheumatoid arthritis they are telling this is due to weakness of the tibialis posterior tibialis posterior insufficiency acute onset tibialis posterior insufficiency causes sudden onset flat foot this is not very peculiar we know flat foot congenital flat foot we know okay many of us normally we are having physiologically many of us are having flat foot but somebody is having an excellent arch suddenly developing flat foot if there is tibialis posterior insufficiency rule out rheumatoid arthritis that is sudden onset flat foot then it can cause protrusio acetabuli and baker cyst baker cyst the knee joint baker cyst popliteal cyst the cause may be rheumatoid so these are the typical deformities okay so i i hope because since they are swan neck next time they may give a picture of button hole now i am going to show you some images you see here this is the classical dinner fork deformity you look at here in the proximal interphalangeal joint this you look at this this is classically this deformity is called botanius deformity other is called button hole deformity so button hole deformity in proximal interphalangeal joint swan neck deformity in distal interphalangeal joint so next time they may ask this image they may keep this image they ask you what is this deformity this is the classical button hole deformity or botanius deformity and this is the classical wind swept deformity i was mentioning the lower limb you see one knee is in genu valgum another knee is in genu varum so this is called a classical wind swept deformity okay then radiological feature just for completion sake i am telling because something tells my mind this year they may ask this in rheumatoid see what are the two classical radiological signs of rheumatoid whenever you read this word the diagnosis is rheumatoid arthritis unless otherwise proved i am going to tell you two words technical words number 1 we all know this is a knee joint x ray ap view lateral view ap view lateral view you see the ap view joint space is very much narrowed joint space is very much narrowed when you analyze that when you look at that very carefully 
there is joint space narrowing in the medial aspect as well as in the lateral aspect and it's very uniform very uniform i will rub and i'll show you now you see okay it's very uniform is it not is it not so it's very uniform this is called symmetrical joint space narrowing what is that symmetrical symmetrical joint space narrowing symmetrical joint space narrowing because joint space narrowing is divided radiologically into two types one is called symmetrical joint space narrowing another is called asymmetrical joint space narrowing when a word symmetrical joint space narrowing comes the answer is straight away rheumatoid arthritis answer is rheumatoid arthritis when it is asymmetrical joint space narrowing what do you mean by asymmetrical joint space medial component there is joint space narrowing lateral component there is no joint space narrowing lateral lateral component lateral side it is normal medial side it is narrowed that's called asymmetrical joint space narrowing diagnosis osteoarthritis okay whenever a question dear friends please strongly have this in your mind in the question symmetrical joint space narrowing diagnosis rheumatoid arthritis asymmetrical joint space narrowing diagnosis is osteoarthritis okay so one point i had taught you one classical feature symmetrical joint space narrowing second golden word we all know dear friends this is the articular surface this is the articular surface okay i will rub and show this is the articular surface whenever a word or whenever you see when you see this x ray just around the articular surface there is decreased density of the bone that is called osteopenia okay that's called osteopenia otherwise osteoporosis osteopenia decreased bone mass the word osteopenia or osteoporosis whenever there is periarticular osteoporosis whenever a word comes periarticular osteopenia periarticular osteoporosis the only diagnosis is rheumatoid arthritis so radiologically dear friends two golden points number 1 symmetrical joint space narrowing number 2 periarticular osteoporosis okay so these are the questions expected from this topic it's in and around this mcq we'll move on to the third mcq okay you see a 20 year old patient presents with painful swelling in the index finger he has a 20 year old patient has pain in the index finger pain and swelling in the index finger okay and especially in the proximal phalanx and x ray was done and the x ray shows the following finding what is the most likely diagnosis let us read the x ray this is x ray of a hand and it's showing a pathology in the proximal phalanx of the index finger proximal phalanx of the index finger what i am seeing i am seeing an osteolytic area and the osteolytic area is very much inside here it is not protruding outside it's inside in the cancellous bone an osteolytic area in the proximal phalanx okay so what could be the possible diagnosis we all know that definitely it can't be osteosarcoma because osteosarcoma first of all the most common site is in and around the knee joint in and around the knee joint heaving sarcoma again it happens in long bone in diaphysis okay in diaphysis osteoclastoma it is otherwise called giant cell tumor again the most common site is in and around the knee joint heaving sarcoma is also in and around the knee joint i will tell you very precisely since it's an mcq class most common site of osteogenic sarcoma lower end of femur most common site of giant cell tumor lower end of femur most common site of heaving sarcoma upper end of tibia this is from the textbook we can't change the answers so all these tumors no this malignant tumors the most common site is around the knee joint okay here they had shown a finger obviously by this time you know the answer this is other is called enchondroma this is other is called enchondroma enchondroma is the right answer enchondroma because 
the the previous one mcq we are seeing about that the tumor it was osteochondroma osteochondroma is other is called exostosis exo means outside it's protruding outside the bone but this is there is a destruction inside the bone especially in the cancellous bone n means inside exo means outside exostosis protruding outside exo this is inside the bone n chondroma okay so uh, chondroma is other is called n chondroma osteochondroma is other is called exostosis okay now what are the things it is it is due to destruction of the cancellous bone again this is a precancerous condition it has it's a precancerous it's a pre malignant condition there is potential for undergoing malignancy the age is around 10 to 50 years wide range that's what the book gives but this guy had given in the question they given 20 so 10 to 50 years most common site is phalanges especially little finger one lakh time repeated mcq dear friends most common site of enchondroma little finger second common site of enchondroma ring finger okay it can happen anywhere in the digit any phalanx okay x-ray the classical finding x-ray is osteolytic lesion lytic lesion with wisp of calcification is very pathognomonic and the treatment of choice is curatage with wall cauterization you have to do a curatage wall cauterization recurrence is very very common that's why you are doing wall cauterization one important thing since it's a huge lytic lesion is happening in the cancellous bone when you scoop out everything no the bone will become weak and more prone for pathological fractures this enchondroma post treatment very high chance of pathological fractures we'll move on to the next question a 80 year old female 80 year old female presented <coughs> was brought to the casualty with history of slip and fall in the bathroom so this is a what is this, this is a trivial injury not a road traffic action this is a slippage in the bathroom okay so it's a domestic accident which is happening inside the house so this is not a road traffic accident it's a domestic accident that means a trivial fall yes she is having pain in the left hip and is unable to walk she has no history of osteoarthritis on examination the left lower limb attitude is shortened externally rotated it is shortened and externally rotated x-ray shows the following finding what is your management so this is fmg january 2023 question 80 year old female a post menopausal female when somebody has fallen down pain around the hip the first thing that should strike our mind is fracture neck of femur there is that's the first differential diagnosis fracture neck of femur okay so when you see this x-ray obviously it shows you see head is here head is here and neck is here greater trochanter this is lesser trochanter neck is here so this is a classical fracture neck of femur classical fracture neck of femur there is no doubt classical neck of femur fracture the question they had asked is what is the management you will do internal fixation with cancellous screw mayor's operation hemiarthroplasty mcmurray osteotomy obviously we know the answer okay so there is fracture neck of femur the elderly individual 80 year old female she has go fall in the bathroom it says that till the injury happened she was ambulant she was walking so she wants her walk back she wants her mobility back immediately we should do hemi arthroplasty i will explain why that is the treatment of choice the answer is hemi arthroplasty internal fixation with cancellous screw internal fixation with cancellous screw it is useless in this patient because you see the fracture is a complete fracture an osteoporotic bone definitely we all know dear friends why we are going for hemiarthroplasty neck of femur fracture the complication we will expect is avascular necrosis of head of the femur 99 percentage your head of the femur won't survive especially in this age in young age other modalities are available in old age the only treatment available is hemiarthroplasty because definitely 99 percentage the head will go for avascular necrosis 
what is the use of fixing its screw and all doing all those experiments that is not possible that's not needed it is not a scientific treatment in this age and this type of fracture pattern so hemiarthroplasty is a straightforward answer i want to teach you the classification of fracture neck of femur you should be very thorough in the, the classification the classical the classification is called gordon's classification when you know the gordon's classification whatever age they give whatever clinical history they give you will write the correct mode of treatment the correct modality of treatment we can be very clear okay shall we see the gordon's classification you all know i know that it's a revision for you gordon's classification grade 1 grade 2 grade 3 grade 4 you can use the word grade or you can use the word type type 1 type 2 type 3 type 4 grade 1 grade 2 grade 3 grade 4 grade 1 incomplete fracture the fracture is incomplete okay fracture line since the fracture is incomplete definitely there won't be any displacement fracture itself is not complete incomplete fracture that means 100 percentage there won't be any displacement so once you had read that incomplete in grade 2 complete but undisplaced grade 3 complete partially displaced grade 4 complete totally displaced okay this is the basic teaching second point in each classification you should know the alignment of the trabecular pattern trabecular pattern you see here dear friends you are seeing these lines no this these lines these lines you are seeing here they are called trabeculae they are called trabeculae so trabecular pattern you should take three trabecular patterns into account number 1 acetabular trabecular pattern number 2 head of the femur trabecular pattern number 3 neck of the femur trabecular pattern the alignment is very important the alignment is very important in grade 1 there is incomplete fracture line so completely the normally aligned trabecular pattern acetabulum head and neck it is anatomically everything is normal so this is type 1 type 2 complete fracture but definitely it is undisplaced just complete fracture hair line is there but totally it is undisplaced it is not disturbed so trabecular pattern is well maintained in type 3 fracture is complete partially it is displaced when partially it is displaced also trabecular pattern of the femoral head not aligned with acetabulum trabecular pattern is changed that is type 3 type 4 complete fracture with total displacement 100 percentage distal fragment gets externally rotated head comes in normal position so trabecular pattern of the head assumes parallel orientation to the acetabulum and book says if it is grade 4 prognosis is worst what prognosis is telling chance of avascular necrosis 100% will go for avn of head of femur so it should be treated with one particular modality okay now we had now we are very clear in what are the four gardens type when you have this in your mind treatment is child's play treatment is child's play if it is gardens type 1 conservative management either you can immobilize the hip with hip spica okay you can put three point three point screw fixation three point that cancel a screw he has used the word no so three point screw fixation that's called cancellus so in the choice one they had asked a question no the choice one internal fixation cancel a screw this can be done only in one situation if it is gardens type 1 if it is gardens type 1 okay right if it is gardens type 2 that is fracture is complete but it is not at all displaced then it can be fixed with a dynamic hip screw it can be fixed with a dynamic hip screw okay if it is gardens type 3 type 4 that is partially displaced or completely displaced you have to do a replacement that's called prosthetic replacement prosthetic replacement is of two types one is called hemi arthroplasty another is called total hip replacement two modalities available total hip replacement these two are hemi arthroplasty prosthesis because they may ask this as when something with these holes this fenestration a prosthesis fenestration okay this is called austin moore's prosthesis amp austin moore's prosthesis when a prosthesis is there without any fenestration 
This is called Thomson's prosthesis. Okay, Thomson's prosthesis. Right. Nowadays, the latest thing, what we are doing, all these things, these two, they are called <coughs> monopolar. Everything is only one unit. So, this will go, this will be moving like this inside the acetabulum. So, this can cause degeneration of acetabulum much earlier. Nowadays, a new thing called bipolar. You see, this is a separate unit. The stem is a separate unit. So, this, this head is not directly moving over the acetabulum. There is a part here. So, stem will move inside the head, which is the artificial head. So, degeneration or damage to acetabulum is less. This is called bipolar processes. This is called bipolar prosthesis bipolar prosthesis okay so nowadays the latest thing is bipolar hemiarthroplasty okay so now now we know very clearly what is gardens type 1 type 2 type 3 type 4 now we will go back to the x-ray that is given in your exam you see here head is fracture is complete you see neck is here neck is here head is totally there so the fracture is complete and there is total displacement. So, is this is grade 4 gardens. Grade 4 gardens, what is the only treatment? Prosthetic replacement. So, prosthetic replacement means either it should be hemiarthroplasty or total hip replacement. So, if it is hemiarthroplasty, what is the indication? If acetabulum is fine, if acetabulum is well, it is not damaged, it is fine. If you replace the head alone, that is enough. That's called hemiarthroplasty. If acetabulum is also damaged, you should replace head of the femur with the acetabulum. That is called a total hip replacement. That is called total hip replacement. So that's not needed for this age. So hemiarthroplasty, so very simple. So that's the answer. So this is gardens grade 4. Coming to the next question, dear friends. A patient presents with swelling and tenderness in the anatomical snuff box. Clinically, patient had fallen outstretched hand. Okay. And pain is there in the anatomical snuff box. By this time, you know the diagnosis. Definitely, it's a scaphoid fracture. It's a scaphoid fracture. A fallen outstretched hand. The image given below shows the cast. Okay. Used to manage the patient injury. Identify the fracture. This is... FMG June 2022 question he is asking to identify the cast obviously he has given a very classical history in, even in the history should have added one more word young patient because most common fracture of young adults scaphoid most common fracture of elderly colis okay elderly colis young patient scaphoid most common fracture in the upper limb in children supracondylar most common fracture of a newborn clavicle okay all the most common happens only in upper limb fall on outside somebody is falling like that newborn clavicle children supracondylar young adults scaphoid elderly colis fracture okay this is the most common fractures okay so he should have added a word a patient a young patient presents with swelling and tenderness in the anatomical snuff box okay anatomical snuff box after sustaining fall on outstretched hand, the image shows what type of cast. Obviously, this cast is called, you see, what is this cast? What is this cast depicts? This is a cast like this. Yes or no? A cast is looking like this. This is a below elbow POP cast in glass holding position. Other is called tumbler holding position. So, a glass holding or tumbler, a glass holding position. Okay, so this cast is classically called a scaphoid cast. It has a name also, scaphoid cast. So the answer obviously it is scaphoid fracture. And this is a scaphoid cast. What is name of the cast? By this time you would have guessed. Okay, see it's, even though it's a live, I can't see the chat box. Okay, it, it will affect our flow. Right, that's why I had given the cell phone there. I'm taking the class. By this time you would have guessed, many would have guessed. The name of the cast, scaphoid cast, what is the name of the cast? It is called bowler gauntlet. Cast. The scaphoid cast is called bowler gauntlet cast. The scaphoid cast, the technical term is 
bowler gauntlet cast it's called a scaphoid cast it is a below elbow pop cast in glass holding or tumbler holding position let us see okay the treatment of scaphoid fracture we all i told you scaphoid fracture is the most common fracture of young adults most common carpal bone to get fracture is scaphoid most common mode of injury is fall on outstretched hand classical clinical feature is pain and swelling in the anatomical snuff box what are the two classical tests we can do for scaphoid one is called scaphoid lift test another is called watson's test two clinical tests watson w a t s o n watson what do you mean by watson's test you just keep the patient's hand over a table like this okay over a table like this right you ask the patient in an ulnar deviated position you make the patient from ulnar deviation make the patient to deviate towards the radial side patient learns severe pain in the anatomical snuff box that is a sign of scaphoid fracture that's called watson w a t s o n watson's test so these are the all these points we know how to diagnose a scaphoid fracture i should take an wrist oblique view that's called scaphoid view that will show you a fracture line if it is not picked by a simple x ray mri is a next best investigation which can detect even a hairline scaphoid fracture mri is a superior investigation than x ray as far as scaphoid is concerned very important and what are the parts of scaphoid proximal pole distal pole waist most common site of scaphoid fracture is waist okay waist what's the problem waist get fractured distal pole waist proximal pole this is the order all the blood vessel enter through the distal pole if waist is fractured proximal pole will suffer ischemia so the very the, the major complication of scaphoid fracture why we are scared about scaphoid fracture even though this is a small bone 40 percentage chance of avascular necrosis of proximal pole of scaphoid that is why the treatment reduction perfect reduction and maintain maintenance immobilization is so important you won't believe dear friends maximum amount of immobilization in orthopedics is given for scaphoid fracture it's a small bone it's a small bone this much size tibia fem femur humerus so big bones but we won't immobilize usually 68 weeks this is the area where we will immobilize for 10 weeks immobilization because of fear of avascular necrosis of the proximal pole of scaphoid 40 percentage however good an orthopedician however cooperative a patient is the chance of avascular necrosis of proximal pole of scaphoid is 40 100 cases we are treating 40 will go for avascular necrosis that is the problem dear friends so coming to the management if it's an undisplaced fracture scaphoid most can be reduced most of the scaphoid united by scaphoid cast with you see 10 weeks i said no maximum immobilization 10 weeks the scaphoid cast is called bowler gauntlet cast is a below elbow cast in glass holding position the same time it's not a, it's, this is the treatment of choice for a undisplaced scaphoid fracture even minimal displacement is there guaranteed if you don't open and reduce it it will go for avascular necrosis proximal pole will go for avascular necrosis so that open reduction internal fixation with what is called a herbert screw several times repeated mcq you see here herbert screw you have to fix it with the herbert screw you see the peculiarity of the screw dear friends the screw has no head it's a headless screw so the screw should be buried inside the scaphoid should be buried inside the scaphoid you are not supposed to remove it back okay so it's buried inside the scaphoid herbert screw fixation herbert that's the treatment of choice for displaced scaphoid fracture and proximal pole of scaphoid proximal pole of scaphoid the avascular necrosis 40 percentage what is name of the disease by this time you would have guessed you know the answer okay the avian avascular necrosis of proximal pole of scaphoid is called precier's disease precier's disease is avascular necrosis of proximal pole of scaphoid okay yes we'll go to the next question a young boy a young patient presented to the emergency department with pain and swelling on the right knee 
plain radiograph shows the following finding what is the best treatment given condition for the given condition the x-ray it is fmg june 2022 okay you see here obviously this shows x-ray of the lateral view of the knee i am able to see okay the petala into two pieces okay so this is a fracture petala diagnosis is fracture petala the question they are asking what is the treatment of choice for this to my knowledge this looks like a transverse fracture petala so petalectomy is not needed petalectomy is for severely commutated fracture petala cylinder cast it is immobilization in a cylinder cast okay cylinder cast means you will put a pop cast from middle of the thigh to middle of the leg okay the knee joint is straight that's called a cylinder cast that is done only for an undisplaced fracture here definitely the displacement the gap is definitely more than more than two millimeters definitely so this is called a displaced fracture petala so conservative management is not possible tension band wiring with cancellous screw there is that this procedure is with cancellous screw means it is not a proper thing tension band wiring with k wire is the right answer tension band wiring means it's always with k wire tension band wiring with k wire okay let us see right let us see see treatment of fracture petala you know fracture petala petala is the largest sesamoid bone in the human body okay petala usually direct hit over the floor types of the uh, the classification of fracture petal petala petala fracture most common type is transverse second common type is comminuted okay all other types oblique and all is very rare so transverse comminuted in that transverse fracture you should know when you will call that as displaced when it is called undisplaced when the gap between the fracture fragment is less than 2 millimeter it's called undisplaced when the gap is more than 2 millimeter it's called displaced so coming to treatment of undisplaced fracture petala cylinder cast that is called tube cast or cylinder cast is the treatment of choice conservative is the treatment of choice for 6 weeks if it is a displaced fracture petala the treatment of choice is surgery that too it is called martin circumferential tension band wiring it's called martin circumferential tension band wiring is the treatment of choice what is that you just proximal pole of petala distal pole of petala you fix both the poles through the bone through with two k wires and tighten it with a figure of eight like with your stainless steel wire that is called see like this you are able to see here the tension band is given like figure of eight okay figure of eight so figure of eight okay you see so this is called tension band wiring okay when the patient flexes the tension band principle it causes compression of the fracture site flexion causes compression of the fracture site this is called tension band principle and that's the treatment of choice the fracture will unite excellently will get excellent result if it is completely commuted into very thrown into small small bits you can't reconstruct the treatment of choice for a severely commuted fracture petala is petalectomy is called petalectomy just i'll give you an extra point Petalectomy goes by one surgery name. This is called West and Soto Hall. West and Soto Hall procedure. Okay, procedure. West and Soto Hall's procedure. Okay, yes. And West and Soto Hall's procedure. I will, I just, I will tell you a thing. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you a thing. We have, yeah, extensor lag. You should know about extensor lag. You may ask a question, sir, petala is highly commutated. We remove the petala. What will happen, sir? If I do a petalectomy, what is the side effect? What is the adverse thing the patient will get after that? What is, yes, what will you get? What is the complication of petalectomy? Petalectomy, patient can walk normally, can squat normally, can sit cross leg, can uh, climb stairs, upstairs, downstairs, no problem. Only thing, last 10 degree extension is not possible the knee joint you know 0 to 140 140 to 0 after that 0 10 degrees of hyper extension is possible this is a normal range of movement of a knee joint that last 10 degree extension is not possible 
after petalectomy that is called extensor lag or quadriceps lag other is called extensor lag that's the only complication of petalectomy otherwise no no you can't see any difference okay after petalectomy so petalectomy is reserved only for a comminuted fracture petala very severely comminuted fracture petala yes we'll move on to the next question dear friends you see a 30 year old male presented with chief complaints of gradually progressive swelling around his wrist okay I am able to see gradually progressive around the wrist. I am able to see some scar mark. Probably some biopsy was done. Something was done. Some procedure was done around the wrist for three months. Given below is the image of the swelling and the X-ray film. What is the most likely diagnosis? See, I am able to see a bulge, a swelling in the wrist. Grossly, I am able to see very clearly. In the X-ray, what I am seeing, AP view of the wrist. In the radius, I am able to see an osteolytic lesion whole thing whole thing is an osteolytic lesion okay now i will rub you see the whole thing is an osteolytic lesion the distal radius okay he is asking what is the diagnosis i told you whenever you are suspecting a bone tumor first you locate the site is it from diaphysis metaphysis epiphysis then you see whether osteolytic lesion or osteosclerotic lesion, what type of lesion is it? Obviously, this is a lytic lesion. Number two, it is there in the epiphysis also. Age is 30 years, site is distal radius. Obviously, it says this should be a case of osteoclastoma, otherwise giant cell tumor. Osteoclastoma, otherwise giant cell tumor. You say Ewing sarcoma. Osteosarcoma, osteochondroma, osteoclastoma. Osteoclastoma is other is called giant cell tumor. So obviously the answer is osteoclastoma. This is the answer. Why I am telling it's not Ewing sarcoma? Ewing sarcoma number one most common site is upper tibia and it is a diaphyseal tumor. Osteosarcoma, yes, it's a metaphyseal tumor, but the most common site is distal femur. And the age is 20 years. Age is 20 years. And it won't show you a lytic lesion. It will show you a sclerotic lesion. Sclerotic lesion. And this will show you what is called periosteal reaction. Periosteal reaction. You can't say that it won't happen in radius. It took it, you can't say. Distal femur is the most common bone. It can happen in any bone, but it show you periosteal reaction. It show you osteosclerosis, show you a sundry appearance, show you a Cardman's triangle because periosteal reaction. All these things should be there. Here, nothing. I am able, not able to see anything except an osteolytic lesion. Okay. Yes. In the epiphysis, that is a metaphyseal tumor. Osteogenic sarcoma is a metaphyseal tumor. The osteochondroma, obviously this is exostosis, totally the presentation radiological finding will be different. So convincingly the answer is osteoclastoma. Dear friends, please make a note, check your question bank if you don't believe me. In past five years, the same question, same picture have been repeated thrice. Same question because I had gone through the paper, gone through the paper, repeats I had avoided here. The same question, same x-ray, they are repeated thrice. Be okay, careful. So something tells my mind, this year also they can ask the same question. Such a okay, common repeats, right? So this is osteoclastoma. Now, what are the radiological features, x-ray finding of osteoclastoma, otherwise called giant cell tumor? Cortex is expanded and thinned out. You see the cortex is expanded thinned out no periosteal newborn formation this is the highlight this is the point if it shows periosteal reaction it is osteogenic sarcoma some other tumor it is not this so no periosteal bone formation thin septae of bone traverses the interior and produce the classical soap bubble appearance one lakh time repeated mcq 
in that previous question in the, in the, the question paper the x-ray where they had given doesn't show a very classical soap bubble like this okay so it is an osteolytic lesion with with septa in between gives a classical soap bubble appearance treatment of choice is surgical excision is the treatment of choice okay the treatment of choice yes it's called giant cell tumor it's called giant cell tumor coming to the next question a six weeks old underline the word a six weeks old child is brought to the outpatient department with the deformity as shown in the image given below which are the following is your line of management obviously when i see this image no grass this is a case of ctv this is a case of ctev otherwise called club foot okay club foot obviously the foot looks like a golf club exactly like a golf club so it's called club foot obvious right so what is the following you are following is your line of management six weeks child that's the question they are asked you all know just for revision sake before going to the treatment the revision sake i'm telling you congenital talipus equinovarus common in boys more it is unilateral ddh is sorry ddh is bilateral this is ddh is unilateral this is bilateral so 50 percentage it is bilateral more common in boys ddh is common in girls okay why ctev is developing in some babies not all babies what's the problem what's the basic pathogenesis many hypotheses were there like abnormal intrauterine position all those things not accepted nowadays the most accepted hypothesis is primary germ cell defect in the talus primary germ cell defect in the talus so talus is not fully formed faulty formation of the talus so talus will become small and change in shape so faulty size faulty shape of the talus results in congenital talonavicular dislocation that is the pathology why ctv is happening the recent hypothesis most accepted hypothesis this year they may ask this as a question okay the pathogenesis is primary germplasm defect of the talus causing congenital talonavicular dislocation that's why ctv okay what are the three classical deformity or four classical deformity four so three is the classical deformity of ctv equinus at the ankle varus at the subtaloid joint four foot adduction four foot means torso metatarsal adduction so four foot adduction varus at subtaloid joint equinus at ankle these are the three classical deformities of ctev okay so when you know this deformity you should correct in an order there is an age wise treatment protocol okay now let us see i had given you in this in the slide but don't take down all these things i will make much simpler for you age wise treatment protocol okay just concentrate look at me concentrate very simple i'll finish in five lines when you read the textbook two pages when you read tajian okay that's the pediatric orthopedics many pages okay i'll just make it into five lines very simple zero to six weeks okay zero to eight weeks zero to eight weeks zero means birth from birth to eight weeks number one eight weeks to five years number two five years to ten years number three ten years and above how to classify when you read the whole book no you will arrive at only my point this this point you will arrive at this point i had read for you i read for many times i had read many years i had read we are practicing just follow this i'll make very simple for you management of ctv zero from birth to eight weeks eight weeks to five years five years to ten years ten years and above okay what will you do zero to eight weeks that is from birth to eight weeks manipulation by mother manipulation by mother that's correction the physiotherapist or orthopedician will teach the mother how to correct then ponsettis method okay ponsettis method one more method was their kites method ponsetti kite the controversy is not needed for ugs ponsetti is superior serial correction 
okay ponsetti's method so right this is 0 to 8 weeks ctv should get corrected with manipulation alone if it is not getting corrected by this proper method by an orthopedician even after 8 weeks that's called a resistant case that's called a resistant case so from 8 weeks to 5 years simple manipulation all these things is not enough you should go for surgery what is that soft tissue release you are releasing few structures where posteromedial aspect of the foot posteromedial aspect of the foot okay so it is posteromedial soft tissue release pmstr posteromedial soft tissue release pmstr and this goes by a surgery name called turcos procedure t u r c o turcos procedure posteromedial soft tissue release posteromedially many structures actually speaking 13 structures are released and it's not needed for you remember two things tendo achilles tibialis posterior these two structures they are released because tightening because the equinus at the ankle all those things should be corrected no so posteromedial soft tissue release so with one surgery or two surgery this should get corrected within five years two it is eight weeks to five years it should get corrected if even by fifth year by with simple soft tissue procedure ctv is not getting corrected after five years there is no use of again and again doing the same soft tissue procedure you should go for bony reshaping you are reshaping the talus you are reshaping the calcaneum bony reshaping that's called dilwin evans procedure that's called dilwin evans procedure okay soft tissue it, it, sorry it's bony reshaping and you it is permitted up to 10 years more than 10 years that is called the neglected ctv neglected ctv you can't do anything except triple orthrodesis you can't do anything except triple orthrodesis triple orthrodesis does not to my knowledge it does not have any special name but you should know what are the joints that are fused triple means three triple orthrodesis what are the joints that are fused it is calcaneocuboid talonavicular subtalar calcaneocuboid talonavicular subtalar these three joints should be fused and this is called triple orthrodesis so shall we revise one once more very important from birth to eight weeks manipulation by mother and ponsetti's method eight weeks to five years soft tissue procedure called turcos procedure which is posteromedial soft tissue release five years to ten years bony reshaping that's called dilwin evans uh, procedure bony reshaping about ten years triple orthrodesis this is when you read very carefully read several times you will come to a conclusion like this what i am telling okay so i made it so simple for your mcq approach very simple now you read the question a six weeks old child is brought to the opd with the deformity showing the image given below which of the following is your line of management six weeks okay manipulation and cast something strikes that should be the right answer postromedial soft tissue release wait it has time six weeks is not that time triple arthrodesis so it's not 10 years evans procedure the full name is dilwin evans again the age doesn't suit so with a flash with confidently you can answer the right answer is manipulation and cast okay this is called ponsetti okay this is called ponsetti's method is the treatment of choice the treatment of choice okay good you want to read detail about ctv the association is a very important topic dear friends the topic alone will take minimum 45 to 50 minutes it's there in our recording just go and see the prepared video for you ctv cdh videos for you okay fully it is in detail i had discussed the path with a lot of photographs images okay and by the by again it's my thing to say that when you are a newcomer for the first time you are seeing our video please subscribe it okay and you are seeing it repeatedly just if you like the video give a like and share to your friends thank you okay all these things i have explained it now we'll move on to the next question okay yes you see a 34 year old male presented with history of progressive lower back ache progressive low back ache okay early morning stiffness 
for the past six months is the duration his symptom are more severe in the morning that is after rest improves with exercise hmm. very catching very catching this itself had given you the answer okay morning there was severe stiffness with the exercise it's improving the stiffness decreases pain decreases okay yes he is known case of ulcerative colitis associated ulcerative colitis okay and an x-ray lumbar spine is taken and given the classical thing feature what's your diagnosis is fmg june 2022 question x-ray this is the classical x-ray of what is called a bamboo spine okay this is a bamboo spine bookish x-ray of bamboo spine whenever you know the word bamboo spine the answer is known to you okay part spine means tb it's different condition psoriatic arthritis won't involve this area the answer is ankylosing spondylitis the answer is ankylosing spondylitis rheumatoid arthritis will not cause backache rheumatoid arthritis will not cause backache my professor used to say always in clinics he will call the students only by name okay jambu if somebody says that backache it is not rheumatoid yeah he will say okay so it is the low backache because you know pretty well the first site or the most common site of affection and ankylosing spondylitis is sacroiliac joint sacroiliitis that's the first presentation how it will be when you go for rest when you are sleeping for quite some time when you get up no you will have backache when you start walking the backache will come down that is the classical presentation and it's hla b27 associated condition so ulcerative colitis okay now let us see so this is the classically here yeah, compared to the bamboo it's there already i had given in image based discussion we had seen this so this is the same x-ray in your exam new arc criteria for ankylosing spondylitis rheumatoid arthritis there is a separate criteria american rheumatism association criteria so this is a new arc criteria for ankylosing spondylitis number one three months of inflammatory backache that improves with exercise and worsens with rest that's why in the history he has given in fmg exam six months duration so it is three months more than three months it's it's satisfying the criteria number two limitation of lumbar movement in both frontal and sagittal direction so frontal flexion extension sideways sagittal direction limitation of chest expansion okay because you know the chest joints they are the rib cages is affected so limitation of chest expansion bilateral sacroiliitis four things it and x-ray shows a classical bamboo spine it shows a sacroiliitis x-ray shows a sacroiliitis it requires one clinical and one radiological feature to confirm the diagnosis okay so this is called new york criteria for ankylosing spondylitis next question a young male who had a road traffic accident is brought to the emergency department his left leg is shortened you see internally rotated and adducted oh classical attitude right limb length is shortened adducted internally rotated shortened adducted internally rotated classically on examination femoral artery pulsation is not felt that is called positive vascular sign of narath positive vascular sign of narath a plain radiograph is taken and shows the following i am able to see this x-ray the femur is adducted right the head is out of the acetabulum head is out of the acetabulum lying posterior to the acetabulum okay so obviously the diagnosis is posterior dislocation hip in posterior dislocation hip vascular sign of narath will be positive the attitude is adduction flexion shortening flexion adduction internal rotation is the attitude of posterior dislocation of hip exact opposite is anterior dislocation lengthening abduction external rotation then it is anterior dislocation hip in anterior dislocation hip the head of the femur is in front of the acetabulum 
anterior to the acetabulum. So vascular no sign of Narath is not positive. You can feel the femoral artery pulse if it is anterior. You can't feel the femoral artery pulse if it is posterior. Very classical history, classical x-ray. Okay. Yes. Post dislocation hip. Because, dear friends, just two minutes, let us revise the dislocation hips. It will be useful for you. Hip dislocation is of three types. Posterior dislocation, anterior dislocation, central dislocation. Most common type is posterior. Second common type is anterior. Least common type is central dislocation. Central means what happens? No, the floor of the acetabulum is broken. The head enters into the pelvic cavity. That is called central dislocation of hip. Okay, three types of dislocation. Only in central dislocation hip, when you do a perrectal examination, head of femur is, palp is palpable with your index finger. Then it is central dislocation hip. So the attitude, no, most common type in the three is posterior. Most common mode of injury is called dashboard injury. This is the most common mechanism, method. This is a dashboard injury. What is that? Patient is sitting in the car, in the front seat, hip flexed, knee flexed to 90 degree, has was not wearing the seat belt. Head-on collision has happened. Both the knees will go and dash against the dashboard. Postal dislocation hip happens. This is the most common mode. Okay. So the attitude is see flexion, adduction, internal rotation of the hip. That's the attitude. Right. So this is what about posterior and vascular sign of Narath will be positive. I explained already. Right. <clears throat> A very practical thing. CT scan is in um, um, X-ray is enough to diagnose. We are doing CT scan to rule out. Is the it's is the it is a pure dislocation or it's associated with any acetabular fractures? Because acetabular fractures we, we may miss in the simple x-ray. So CT scan is always superior. Okay. So a very practical way to differentiate posterior dislocation hip from anterior dislocation hip by x-ray is that head appears larger if it is anterior dislocation hip and smaller in posterior dislocation because the posterior part of the head is behind the acetabulum. Astablum is obscuring a part of the head. So you will see only half head. So it looks a small head. In anterior dislocation, the whole head is in front of the acetabulum. So you can see the whole head. So head appears larger. So in an x-ray, head appears larger. Okay, and full head you are able to see. It is anterior. Part of head is missing. Small head you are seeing. This is posterior. This is a very practical point. Yes. In you look at this x-ray. You look at this x-ray. You see here. This is your acetabulum, right? Able to see the acetabulum and totally the head is just behind the acetabulum, superior and behind the acetabulum, right? So this is a posterior dislocation hip, a very classical x-ray of posterior dislocation hip. Coming to the treatment, you close reduction under anesthesia is the treatment of choice. Just I'm telling the name alone. Yes, you read that very in detail in our main recording. Treatment techniques are Stimson's gravity method, Alice traction method, Bigelow's method, classical Watson-Jones method, Eastern Baltimore method. Commonly used technique is these two. Okay, classical Watson-Jones and Bigelow's method. Right. Okay. Let us see the next picture. Okay, let us see the next picture. A nine-year-old boy is brought to the hospital with complaints of pain and limping. Okay, pain and limping. Right. The symptoms started six months back and gradually worsened. The child appears to be healthy with normal height and weight. On examination, there is mild wasting of the right thigh. On examination, abduction and internal rotation is limited. This is the golden word. Abduction and internal rotation is limited. This is the golden word. Abduction and internal rotation is limited due to pain. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis is the question. You see here the x-ray. I am able to see x-ray pelvis with both hips AP. In here I am able to see on one side, this side I am seeing a head. Here the head, the shape, everything is maintained. Okay. It is maintained. Right. Okay, it's maintained, able to see, it's okay. Here, totally the shape of the head is altered and it is flat. 
it is flat i don't know dear friends you are able to see a line here you just please concentrate after this no you just zoom in your cell and you see here you able to see a line like this okay i will wipe it out you will see a line like this you have this in your mind what could be the diagnosis it is idiopathic avascular necrosis of head of femur which is otherwise called perthes disease developmental dysplasia it's a disorder which is seen in newborn and infants okay right it won't present like this its presentation is totally different slipped capital femoral epiphysis patient will have a limp everything that is okay but most of the time it is associated with endocrine pathologies so most of the time the, the, the child may be having a short stage otherwise having a micro penis a gynecomasia that's why he is telling height weight everything normal you are not seeing any abnormality hormonal imbalance you are there is no signs of hormonal imbalance that's why in the question he said that height weight everything is normal so slipped capital femoral epiphysis okay scuffy is not a possibility and it, the x-ray won't be like this congenital coxae has a different condition obviously this is called a mushroom shaped head this is called a mushroom shaped head a flat topped head and i am able to see a line like this okay right this is called sagging rope sign sagging rope sign which is very classical of perthes disease which is idiopathic avascular necrosis of head of the femur on clinical examination first see range of movement will be decreased first range of movement that should be affected is adduction also abduction and internal rotation okay you make the child lie down in a supine position okay you flex the hip first abduct and internally rotate both abduction and internal rotation very much restricted and severe pain will be there and the diagnosis is perthes disease abduction internal rotation is limited why it's limited because of severe pain okay the shape of the head is altered so it will go and rub against the acetabulum will cause a sharp pain that's the thing okay so this is perthes disease right <clears throat> coming to the next question what is the type of splint shown in the image come on come on yes very simple yeah obviously this is what is called a cock up splint this is what is called a cock up splint okay so this is called a cock up splint cock up splint is of two types cock up splint is of two types one is called dynamic another is called static okay static or dynamic everything in image base also we have discussed this okay in image base i am you are having beautiful images in that dynamic and static you see we know pretty well cock up splint is given for radial nerve palsy it is the treatment of choice a conservative method of choice to treat a wrist drop radial nerve palsy okay what is cock up splint you know what is a cock me cock up means usually in the the cock you know it will do its head like this so like a cock up okay so it's called a cock up right what happens in wrist drop what is the basic pathogenesis radial nerve palsy wrist drop all extensors are gone flexor is okay extensor is gone extensor is gone so patient can flex patient can't extend and if it's neuropraxia whatever the pathology it will take at least 8 weeks no it will take minimum 8 weeks to recover so for 8 weeks time there is only flexion is there extension is not happening what will happen extensor are very much stressed flexors are like this so this will undergo contracture so constantly it should be extended by two methods you can do like this by the cock up uh, splint you can apply cock up splint one is called static what is that i will do like this put a pop in this flexor aspect like this i will immobilize like this it is available in pop nowadays it's available in silicone process it's available like this plastic pvc and silicone so this is called a static cock up splint it will be like this most of the hours patient should be wearing 
they can remove for quite some time it will go like this after that they have to wear like this this is called a static cock up splint dynamic cock up splint is what that is given in this picture what you see springs are connected these are springs so what happens patient can flex actively patient can flex their wrist like this when they flex like this when they release their when they are not actively flexing when they relax the springs will pull the hand to extension full extension okay so this is called dynamic cock up splint this is called dynamic cock up splint dynamic is superior to static cock up splint so this is the treatment of choice conservative management of choice for a radial nerve palsy so this is a classical picture of dynamic cock up splint he has given just a cock up splint to be more precise that is a dynamic cock up splint coming to the next question a patient sustained a fracture as depicted in the x ray following a fall from height which are the following fracture is known fmge december 2021 see dear friends you concentrate here this is an x ray pelvis with both hips ap i am seeing this is the iliac crest helium okay i am seeing the pubic rami here and the head of the femur acetabulum everything is okay when you see that no very classically here is one pubic rami another is here so pubic rami they are far apart usually pubic rami should be like this no here pubic rami is far apart so what is this this is a type of pelvic fracture this is the type of pelvic fracture for example pubic rami pubic rami should be like this both it should be like this yes sir no it should be like this here it is like this so this is called a open book type of pelvic injury this is what's called an open book type of pelvic injury that's what they had given open book fracture so it's called it's not open it's open book type of pelvic fracture that's more this is what given in your choice but precisely this is called open book type of pelvic fracture okay it's a type of pelvic fracture right and it is not shaffer's fracture shaffer's fracture is nowhere connected with here you should know what is shaffer's fracture shaffer's fracture is radial styloid fracture Shaffer's fracture is radial styloid fracture. Radial styloid. Okay, radial styloid fracture. It's other is called Shaffer's fracture. Other is called backfire fracture. Other is called Hutchinson's fracture. Many synonyms are there. Shaffer's. I will repeat once again, dear friends. So next time they may confuse with another name. Don't get confused. Shaffer's. Shaffer's not driver. Driver's fracture. Shaffer's fracture. Radial styloid fracture. Hutchinson's fracture. backfire fracture all four are synonymous same malgagni fracture is another type of pelvic fracture it's another type of pelvic fracture it is not this bucket handle it's not fracture it's called bucket handle tear which happens in the menisci bucket handle tear that's totally different you see here now coming to the classification of pelvic fracture the classification is called tiles classification when you read no it is given for one and a half pages i made it just simple for you so ug level so that you will be very clear when we teach too much also you will get confused so up to the point exam is fast approaching our aim is to clear the exam okay you see tiles classification type a type b type c three types type a is called stable fracture pelvis fracture has happened small crack is there in the pubic superior pubic rami or inferior pubic rami but is not displaced much and the pelvis is very much stable very much stable that's called type a tiles type a type b rotational rotationally it is unstable vertically it is stable type b is rotationally it is unstable vertically it is stable it is stable that's called type b type c is rotationally and vertically unstable worst type rotationally vertically unstable this will bleed very heavily okay this is a life threatening fracture right under type b rotationally unstable vertically stable that is called 
that one subtype B1 is called external rotation instability and that's called an open book type of pelvic fracture. This is what they had given in the X-ray, open book type of pelvic fracture. So open book type of pelvic fracture comes under type B tiles, comes under type B tiles. Malgagni fracture is, <coughs> you see, when you see an X-ray pelvis like this, Malgagni fracture on one side, hemi side, Totally, there will be fracture everywhere. That's called a Malgagni fracture. That's called a Malgagnian type of fracture. Yes. Moving to the next question. While examining a patient with the right forearm fracture, you ask him to make a fist. Right forearm fracture. Patient has developed a forearm fracture. You are asking him to make a fist like this. Patient is able to flex all the fingers except the index finger he is showing like this okay following finding noted what is the sign called this is called fmge december 2021 and this is called pointing index this is called pointing index this is called a pointing index obviously it is median nerve injury it is obviously the answer is median nerve injury now clinical signs of median nerve injury that is called pointing index, which is called Oshner's clasp test. You ask the patient to do like this. Normally, I should be able to flex all my finger like this. If I am having a median nerve injury on right side, I will do like this. This is called pointing index or this is called Oshner's clasp test. It is called Oshner's clasp test. Another sign that will be positive, no? All the, the thumb, everything will be in direction parallel with the other fingers. This is called ape thumb deformity. Ape thumb deformity is because of abductor pollicis brevis paralysis. The same abductor pollicis brevis paralysis, you can say that you ask the patient to touch a pen. The patient can't abduct and go and touch a pen. Suppose, for example, yeah, my pen is here. Normally, see, I am able to touch. Okay, if my median nerve is gone, I can't touch the pen. So, this is called... A pen test again abductor pollicis brevis paralysis next thing when you ask the patient to do an o like this exact symmetrical circular o can be formed if there is a radial nerve a sorry median nerve injury he can't have a perfect circle it will be like this this is called o sign this is sign for opponents pollicis this is sign for see this is the perfect o able to make a perfect o here he is not able to pick, make a perfect O, that O, the circle is not formed. Okay, so this is called O sign. It's a test for opponents policies. These signs you should not forget in median nerve injury. Okay, yes. A patient was diagnosed with supraspinatus tendinitis. So this is a case, supraspinatus tendinitis means rotator cuff. Rotator cuff is formed by supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, subscapularis okay so this is a case which is related to the rotator cuff injury so supraspinatus tendinitis what degree of movement of shoulder would be painful for this patient initial 60 degree will be painless 60 to 120 will be very painful more than 120 will be painless this is called painful arc syndrome i repeat once again if there is supraspinatus tendinitis or supraspinatus tear Irritation, whatever it is. What is painful arc syndrome? Initial 60 degrees, painless. 60 to 120, very painful. Above 120, again painless. Painful arc syndrome. Okay. This question has been repeated. More than this, no, no other explanation, no other points are there in the book. But this question was repeated twice. Same question, same choice. Okay. So, supraspinatus tendinitis. There will be painful range of movement between 16 to 120 degrees. A patient presents with hip pain and true shortening of the limb, which was diagnosed as tuberculosis of the hip. Okay. Which stage of disease is he currently? Patient is having hip pain, two points, severe pain, true shortening, real shortening is there. This is the key. Okay. So, what stage of the disease is he? This is the FMGE June 2021 question. Stage of early arthritis, stage of synovitis, stage of advanced arthritis, stage of arthritis without subluxation. Four things. For this, you should know stages of tuberculosis of hip. 
which is called babulkar and pande staging in my in our main recording superbly with the diagram i had given no problem i will discuss it for you very simple very simple babulkar and pande staging of tuberculous hip tb hip okay right we will discuss that first then we will come to the question we can't make mixture such a such a simple question for us okay let us discuss the point first babulkar and pandey's clinico radiological staging of tuberculosis of the hip stage 1 is called stage of synovitis stage 2 is called stage of early arthritis stage 3 is called stage of late arthritis or advanced arthritis stage 4 is called stage of pathological dislocation four stages very simple stage of synovitis stage of early arthritis stage of advanced arthritis stage of pathological dislocation only four now let us see stage of synovitis what happens it's a irritable hip and faber means flexion attitude is flexion abduction external rotation and there will be apparent lengthening terminal range of movements may be restricted by 25 percentage stage of synovitis means synovium is inflamed it is causing excessive secretion so many fluids lot of fluids are there inside the hip joint that's called synovitis so what happens the hip will is undergoing a position attitude called flexion abduction external rotation when hip is flexed abducted and external rotated this allows the maximum capacity of the hip joint since excessive secretions are there excessive synovitis means excessive fluid gets accumulated in the hip joint hip joint is going for a position of flexion abduction external rotation so that it can accommodate more fluid okay so this is called stage 1 or stage of synovitis so in flexion abduction external rotation what happens to the limb length increased limb is lengthened okay so this is stage of synovitis stage 1 stage 2 not treated in stage 1 it will go for stage of early arthritis what happens articular cartilage damage then only it's called arthritis articular cartilage damage happens so what happens to the hip flexion it will go to a position attitude called flexion adduction internal rotation flexion adduction internal rotation okay apparent shortening not true shortening apparent shortening happens here gluteus quadriceps muscle wasting all range of movements are decreased by 50 percentage x ray shows signs of uh, x ray shows signs of narrowing of the disc narrowing of the joint space x ray shows signs of narrowing of the joint space okay right so in stage of early arthritis what happens flexion adduction internal rotation apparent shortening happens okay range of movement is restricted in all direction then only it is called arthritis by 50 percentage x ray shows joint space narrowing joint space narrowing yes here in synovitis x ray will show you joint joint space widening here it will show you joint space narrowing coming to the third stage of babulkar and pande stage of advanced arthritis or late arthritis significant destruction of the articular surface so flexion adduction internal rotation becomes more that's called marked failure that's called true shortening happens because the articular cartilage joint space everything is gone so definitely the whole length is decreased so true shortening gross restriction of movement x ray significant subcondral erosion and destruction and the last stage is called stage of pathological dislocation here just i want to tell you here comes the classical traveling astablum very favorite mcq setters question traveling astablum gross destruction of the femoral head or the superior astabular margin causes pathological dislocation the upper end of the femur may displace upwards and dorsally in the outer aspect of the ilium so it is from the original astablum going and sitting in the ilium that's why it's called traveling astablum so this is known as traveling astablum all range of grossly restricted marked shortening sometimes head of femur protrudes medially through the destroyed astablum that's called protrusio astabli like your central dislocation hip so this is stage 4 okay so now we had thoroughly read what is babulkar and pandey's four stages of tb hip stage of synovitis stage of early arthritis stage of late arthritis stage of pathological dislocation
Now we will come back to the question. A patient presents with hip pain through shortening. That's all. Of the limb, which was diagnosed as tuberculosis? What the stage belongs to? Stage of advanced arthritis. Stage of advanced. Because in stage of early arthritis, it is only apparent shortening. It is only apparent shortening. Here comes true shortening. Here comes lengthening. Okay. Here there is protrusio astabli, other is traveling astabli. No way related with this. Okay. Traveling. So obviously the answer is C. Yes. A young man is brought to the emergency department following a road traffic accident. He was driving the car when the accident occurred. Okay. On examination, it is noted that the injury leg is shortened. The image of the pelvis radiograph is shown below. Which of the following nerve is most commonly injured in this given condition? See, dear friends, traveling in a car, I told you dashboard injury, most common mode of post dislocation hip. The x-ray very classically shows head is out of the acetabulum and it is just behind the or superior to the acetabulum. That's beneath the acetabulum. So it's a post dislocation hip. The question he is asking in post dislocation hip, which is the most common nerve that is damaged. Obviously, a child, LKG baby can answer the answer is the sciatic nerve. Answer is sciatic nerve. Okay. Femoral nerve is involved in anterior dislocation hip. Sciatic nerve is involved in post dislocation hip. Okay. Yes. You see, most common nerve affected in post dislocation, the complications of post dislocation hip from the textbook from Apley. Most common nerve involved is sciatic nerve, the two common peroneal division, MCQ, the two peroneal division. Most common vessel involves superior gluteal artery, myositis ossificans is the complication, traumatic osteoarthritis, avascular necrosis is a complication, recurrent dislocation is a complication. So, coming to the point, most common nerve that is involved in post dislocation hip is posterior. Most uh, sorry, po the most common nerve that is involved in post dislocation hip is sciatic. Most common nerve that is involved in anterior dislocation hip is femoral. A patient after sleeping whole night, okay, with the arm hanging over the back of the chair, wakes up with the inability to extend the wrist. Okay, this is due to FMG June 2021 question. Okay, two words he should have added. If you want a textbook description, the chair, whole night he is sleeping like this, under the influence of alcohol, especially Saturday. So what he is meaning is Saturday night policy. Okay, what is this is? Saturday night policy. Okay, so Saturday night policy is a radial nerve policy. The cause everyone knows because here the constant pressure, the cause it is neuropraxia. What is there? Okay, so neurotemesis, neurolysis, axonotemesis, neuro, neuropraxia. The thing what you should know is, the classification is called Sedan's classification. Sedan's classification is 1943. Only three types. Neuropraxia, axonotomesis, neurotomesis. Just what is this? I will tell you. Everything is there. In the main recording, it's there. Just you see. Just I will tell you what is this neuropraxia. This is a transient episode of complete motor with a little sensory paralysis. Look at the second point. Temporary physiological disruption. That means anatomically no damage. Anatomically the nerve is intact. No damage. Just because of stretching physiological disruption. Okay. You see this? Nowhere. The nerve acts on nothing is damaged. Neuro, okay. Sheath. Nothing is damaged. So no anatomical damage. Only physiological disruption. Complete recovery is the rule. Complete recovery is the rule. No, since there is no anatomical damage, you can't expect a valerian degeneration. You can't expect a tinnel sign. Prognosis excellent. Prognosis superb. Recovery begins within two to three weeks. Complete within eight weeks. Examples are crutch palsy, Saturday night palsy. Okay, classical crutch palsy, Saturday night palsy, radial nerve palsy. Okay, so this is neuropraxia. Please read about Sedan's classification. Okay, axonotomosis is there. An axonotomosis, it is more severe. More what is that? Loss of continuity of the axons with maintenance of the outer sheath. Outer sheath is maintained, only axon is cut. In neurotomosis, everything is cut. Everything is cut. This has the worst prognosis. Okay. 
Now coming to the next question. Look at the photograph. What is the splint depicted below? This is given in all our UG books, FMG June 2021 question. This is called foot abduction orthosis. Foot abduction orthosis, which we will give for CTV, which we will give for CTV, congenital talipus equinovarus. This goes by a name. This orthosis is called Steenbeek's foot abduction brace. This is the correct name. It's called Steenbeek's foot abduction brace. This is basically a retainer used to prevent relapse of CTV. Look at this. It's a nice picture. Okay. So, in our ward, no, in government setup, to buy a designed shoe like this and all, it's costly for our patients. What we will do, I will use a wooden scale instead of this bar. How many cases we had done this? Okay. So, the excellent research. This is basically a retainer used to prevent relapse of CTV. In many centers, this is a part of Ponsetti's method. After correction, manual correction, put applying a POP, in between they will keep a scale. We will keep a scale. The what's called that is a modified steam beaks food abduction brace. In my center, it's like this. Okay, we used to do like that. Okay, the extreme foot abduction is maintained in 70 degrees. Foot abduction abducted to 70 degrees. It should be applied full time for first three months. Then only during night time for four years. Okay, this is an MCQ. Practically, I am following a different regime which I don't want to tell you now. Book says that it should be applied all the 24 hours, full time 24 hours for first three months. After three months, for another four years, till four years, it's applied only during night time. So these are the MCQ points you can get from Steen Biggs Foot Abduction Brace. That's a full name. Okay. Yes. Which is a very important thing for, for retainer, for the maintenance after correction with Ponsetti. You are maintaining that position with this Steen Biggs Foot Abduction Brace. Coming to the next question. A 67 year old diabetic patient, underline the word, diabetic patient presented with swelling around the knee, restriction of movement and minimal or no pain. The x-ray of the knee is given below. Okay, so I am able to see some total erosion has happened, dislocation has happened. Okay, so erosions and dislocations are there. So what could be the cause? 67 year old diabetic patient presented with swelling around the knee okay with minimum or no pain no pain is the best answer many times no it is a painless condition what is the cause 67 diabetic definitely this is what is called a charcot's arthropathy otherwise this is called neuropathic joint this is called a neuropathic joint neuropathic joint very interesting very few points also known as neuropathic joint it is progressive degenerative and destructive joint disorder okay it's a destructive joint disorder main pathology is abnormal pain sensation and proprioception because of long standing neuropathy Neuropathy cause may be different. Diabetes is the most common cause. Many causes are there. Because of neuropathy, the joint sense is lost. The pain sense is lost. Proprioception is lost. So the joint get destructed. That is called charcoal. The famous physician charcoal. So it's called charcoal joint. Other is called neuropathic joint. The question we can expect is what are the causes of neuropathic joint? Most common cause in the whole world, dear friends, diabetes mellitus. How many cases to ortho department is referred from general surgery, you know? General surgery. In OP, this will be the usually fight will be between orthopedicians and general surgeons in this area. General surgeons daily they are referring a case. A lot of diabetic foot. Neuropathic joint, ortho opinion, ortho, ortho medicine say this is osteolysis, we won't take, you have to take care of diabetic foot. Okay, right? Because why these guys, general surgeons are referring to us, why we are not taking over the case, prognosis is bad. 
okay that's the reason right so the most common cause is diabetes mellitus most common cause olden day syphilis leprosy all these things no nerve sensation is leprosy meningomyelocele that is spina bifida what is meaning is spina bifida occulta okay spina bifida occulta meningomyelocele spinal cord injury and syringomyelia syringomyelia is very peculiar in one sense dear friends charcoal joint happens in the shoulder when somebody is developing neuropathic joint or shoulder joint uh, so charcoal joint in the shoulder you should rule out syringomyelia syringomyelia causes the charcoal joints of the shoulder other things no the most common area by this diabetes leprosy everything is foot and knee okay yes two types that's not needed for atrophic and hypertrophic types and at book says atrophic type is the most common among the two x-ray features usually described no usually the standard teaching by uh, my professor right in my college no it is described by six d's usually x-ray shows distended joint density increase that is sclerosis will be there debris that is bone will be thrown into small 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 pieces debris they are called loose bodies debris dislocated joint disorganized joint destruction joints osteolysis my professor instead of destruction he use a word dissolving joint instead of destruction my professor will say you better change the word from the book to dissolving of but i can't change the bookish teaching for you so these are the things in x-rays what you can see you can see a distended joint you can see a sclerosed joint you can see small small loose bodies in the joint you can see a dislocated joint you can see a disorganized joint you can see a dissolved joint or, di or a destroyed destroyed joint that's called osteolysis absorbed nothing will be there you can see just an absorption you see the previous x-ray here in the question a dislocated joint a disorganized joint here you are able, able to see small small bits they are called debris loose bodies okay classical osteolysis here one part is missing osteolysis so all are classical x-ray features of charcoal joints yes this question again I repeat dear friends the following clinical sign is elicited in a patient after operation which are the following nerve is injured this is called pointing index osnos osnos clasp test obviously the nerve is median nerve obviously the nerve is median nerve this is a repeat question median nerve injury the brace shown in the given image is a, this is the fmg december 2020 question obviously this is a front and the back no from the back easily can identify this is called taylor's brace this is called taylor's brace so you should know what is boston's brace you should know what is milwaukee's brace what is taylor's brace ash brace where they are used you see one one line okay orthotics one one line this is a taylor's brace this is a taylor's brace what is the indication of taylor's brace patient is having paraspinal muscle spasm severe pain the dorsal lumbar area having a vertebral fracture a compression fracture or patient is having a tb spine some condition on mobility causes pain you want to immobilize for quite some time the choice of brace that's called taylor's brace that's all taylor's brace so this is called ash brace a s h ash brace you see the difference dear friends here the support is given posteriorly here the support is given anteriorly okay so the very idea is to keep my spine in hyper extended position here i have to keep my spine straight in this brace ash in, in taylor's i have to keep my already i am having a lumbar lordosis and cervical lordosis i am keeping a brace to straighten that that is taylor's brace here in ash brace you see the support is given anteriorly so here the idea is to keep me in a hyper extended position they're giving pressure it's like this so this is done for kyphosis given for kyphosis okay the third thing this is called milwaukee brace milwaukee's brace 
Milwaukee's brace is the treatment. This is the brace which is used for congenital scoliosis. Congenital scoliosis. Congenital scoliosis. Milwaukee brace is an advanced thing. Old time honored brace is this is called Boston brace. This is called Boston brace. It's a traditional type of thoracolumbosacral orthosis. Which again, this is a brace which was used for congenital, correct, correct, congenital scoliosis. So these two braces are used only in children, not for adults. Milwaukee. Taylor's is used for anybody. Okay. So this is for vertebral fractures, body of vertebral fracture, painful conditions like part spine, just to immobilize the spine. Okay. This is to correct the kyphosis. Ash brace is used to correct the kyphosis. One, one line, very simple. A 30 year old male comes to the casualty with history of road traffic accident, left hip pain on examination, leg is flexion, abduction, external rotation. You see, not flexion, adduction, internal rotation, flexion, abduction, external rotation with lengthening of the limb. All of the diagnosis is over. This is anterior dislocation hip. Already I told you this is a repeat question. Posterior dislocation hip, flexion, adduction, internal rotation. Anterior dislocation hip, flexion, abduction, external rotation. So, no problem. Anterior dislocation is very rare. Mechanism of injury, posterior dislocation hip, I said dashboard injury. Okay, it is dashboard injury. It is dashboard injury. In anterior dislocation hip, it is forced abduction and lateral rotation, violent RTA, air crash. Okay, yes. So, that's what, no. In, uh, in clinics, no, we used to discuss when we discuss students, no, post dislocation hip, it's a mediocre injury, whereas anterior dislocation hip is a costly injury because this follows an air crash, no, very costly. In anterior dislocation hip, the most common nerve involved, I told you earlier, femoral nerve and vascular sign of Narath is negative, is negative, yes. So, identify the diagnosis, identify the diagnosis, you look at the picture, identify the diagnosis. I am able to see some child sitting, I am able to see a low hairline and a short neck, low hairline and a short neck, okay. So this is classically what is called a Klippelfield syndrome. This is what is classically called a Klippelfield syndrome. In image based discussion, beautiful pictures are there. In essential one-liners of prep ladder, beautiful pictures are there. Go through, all the videos are available for free. Just go through that, okay, Klippelfield syndrome. What is Klippelfield syndrome? Okay, what is Klippelfield syndrome? You see, this is normal cervical vertebra. Okay, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Okay, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Normal cervical vertebra. Normal cervical lordosis is there. You see here, when you see this picture, few of the cervical vertebras are fused together to form only one single unit, man. Okay, I am able to see only three distinct things. You are able to see the difference. I will wipe it out. You just... See again. See, so what is Klippelfield syndrome? Congenitally fused cervical vertebra. Congenitally fused cervical vertebra is called Klippelfield syndrome. Congenitally fused cervical vertebra. What will happen? The length of the neck becomes short, like this. See the picture. And there will be low hairline, low set ear, low hairline. When you see a picture like this, the immediately the thing that comes to your mind can it be Downs? Because in Downs also short neck and low hairline. In Downs there will be mental retardation. In Klippelfield syndrome there is no mental retardation. Mentation is 100% normal. The most common condition that is associated with Klippelfield syndrome is Sprungel shoulder. Congenitally elevated scapula. Okay. So here identify the diagram. The diagram classically it is a Klippelfield syndrome. Klippelfield syndrome is commonly associated with Sprungel shoulder. So, commonly associated with sprungle shoulder. Sprungle shoulder is congenitally elevated scapula. On one side, scapula is at a higher level. Okay? Yes. A 25-year-old male presented to the emergency department with pain and swelling of the right knee. Radiograph shows the following finding. What's the diagnosis? Obviously, obviously, what is that? I'm able to see two poles separate. That's so obviously it's petla fracture. Okay. Yeah, there is no second differential diagnosis. It is not a difficult one. Very straightforward, simple question. Petla fracture, I told you already. This is a repeat. I told you it is uh, divided into undisplaced, displaced. It is displaced again into transverse. That is the most common type. This is transverse is the most common type. Okay. 85 percentage. Next common type is commutated. 
and the only point just you want to the view of choice to see petala is make the patient lie down in prone position keep the cassette down pass the beam from above and that is called skyline view this is called a skyline view of the petala skyline view of the petala this is the x-ray view of choice to visualize petala when you take this view you will not miss even a crack fracture so x-ray view of choice to visualize petala is skyline view other is called axial view other is called axial view obviously treatment of choice already i told you tension band wiring martin circumferential tension band wiring is the treatment of choice okay we'll move on to the next fracture seen in the x-ray what is it fracture see this is the forearm x-ray carpal bones metacarpals radius ulna i am able to see i am able to see the lower the third of radius is fractured radio ulnar joint is disrupted the lateral view i am seeing disruption of the radio ulnar joint in ap view i am seeing the lower third radius fracture so this is nothing but a galeasy fracture the diagnosis is galeasy fracture okay so if you know the definition of these four we can go to the next question okay galeasy fracture is fracture lower third radius with distal radio ulnar subluxation galeasy fracture is fracture lower third radius with distal radio ulnar joint subluxation montagia's fracture is fracture upper third ulna with radial head subluxation radial head is in the proximal radial ulnar joint so i repeat once again montagia's fracture is fracture upper third ulna with proximal radial ulnar joint dislocation smith fracture is reverse coli coli's fracture is distal radial fracture which is extra articular coli's fracture is a distal radial fracture which is extra articular same distal radial fracture when it is intra articular it is called barton okay distal radial fracture which is intra articular is called barton distal radial fracture which is extra articular is called coli's in coli's there should be dorsal tilt and dorsal displacement of the distal fragment when the dorsal tilt and dorsal displacement becomes ventral tilt and ventral displacement that's called smith montagia's fracture is upper third ulna with proximal radial ulnar subluxation galeasy is a lower third radius with distal radial ulnar joint subluxation that's over yes which are the following is the most radio sensitive tumor in bone tumor the only radio sensitive tumor is evings sarcoma it melts with radiation evings sarcoma melts with radiation okay but again it will recur so you should shrink the tumor with radiation after that the definitive management is surgery okay surgery so it's commonly arises from endothelial cells of the bone marrow it's a bone marrow tumor dear friends bone marrow can give rise to two tumors bone marrow from the bone marrow plasma cell a tumor arises that's called multiple myeloma from the bone marrow from the endothelial cell a tumor arises that's called heaving sarcoma okay heaving sarcoma is highly radio sensitive it arises in the diaphysis most common age 10 to 20 years most common to have affected uh, is upper end of tibia and is only tumor which melts with radiotherapy and uh, all these things in image based question it's there classical x-ray signs of heaving uh, sarcoma moth eaten appearance cracked eyes appearance the classical onion peel appearance you see here on the periosteum the the periphery you know the periosteum is just divided into many layers like an onion peel like stripped into many layers like an onion peel so heaving sarcoma is called onion peel appearance repeatedly they are asking only this onion peel appearance again and again two more appearances are there in the given in the book one is called moth eaten appearance of the bone another is cracked eyes appearance of the bone in image based question you can see all these things with the x-rays just go and revise that one more time you just see okay so it's right a 45 year old male patient present to the opd with complaints of increasing pain in his right hand over the past few months on examination there is a palpable lump and on x-ray was done which is given below which of the following is the most probable diagnosis for that when you see this x-ray you should know this is from the finger the x-ray should know some sort of abnormality is there what is this abnormality when you able to identify the diagnosis is easy this there is some calcification and this calcification is classically this is called popcorn calcification popcorn calcification whenever it is popcorn calcification only diagnosis is chondrosarcoma 
the diagnosis is chondrosarcoma okay you see in chondrosarcoma popcorn calcification you are able to see like a popcorn popcorn calcification and x-ray it shows us what's called the endosteal scalloping endosteal scalloping you see here scalloping means absorption resorption so end osteal inside the bone there is absorption of bone inside the cortex inside the cortex there is resorption of bone so that is called end osteal scalloping okay whenever a word end osteal scalloping or popcorn calcification comes the only diagnosis dear friends chondrosarcoma you see chondrosar kindly read our regular uh, this thing our recording you see in detail we had discussed about each and every tumor okay see that that's the classical x-ray of endosteal scalloping or resorption this is the classical x-ray of popcorn calcification in your question same calcification popcorn calcification they had given okay so very very classical feature yes a young male patient sustained a right tibial fracture shaft fracture following a road traffic accident the patient's right leg was immobilized with plaster cast this patient now presents to emergency with severe pain in the leg on examination distal pulse absent okay distal diagnosis confirmed distal pulse absent severe pain in the leg uh, on passive stretching pain stretch stretch pain is there on opening the plaster right leg appears edematous and numerous blisters seen considering the suspected diagnosis what would be the most appropriate management the more the diagnosis this is called compartment syndrome dear friends classical feature of compartment syndrome okay compartment syndrome syndrome this is otherwise called wokman's ischemia compartment syndrome is otherwise called wokman's ischemia it is an orthopedic emergency you have to do something immediately so that the limb will be saved other limb will go permanently this will go for wokman's ischemic contracture so what is that the emergency procedure that's called emergency fasciotomy it's called emergency fasciotomy so emergency fasciotomy is nothing but you just what is that take a 22 blade emergency fasciotomy does not need an orthopedic surgeon or general surgeon house officers procedure what is that take a 22 blade skin subcutaneous tissue deep fascia just do 10 centimeter incision the pressure inside is released so that there is a chance for revascularization the compartment pressure is released okay <coughs> normal intra compartment pressure is 10 to 20 millimeter mercury <coughs> When it exceeds 30 millimeter mercury, it is definitely called a compartment syndrome. It's an orthopedic emergency. You have to release the pressure immediately. The only way we can release the pressure is by emergency fasciotomy. Yes. <coughs> a young girl had thigh swelling with discharging sinus from which a bony fragment came out. The parents were concerned about what is what it was and asked the doctor what is the term used. See, some through a discharging sinus, something come out. That is a dead bone that can come out. What is it called? It's called sequestrum. It's called a sequestrum. Sequestrum. A dead bone is called a sequestrum. Okay. New bone formation is called involucrum. Holes that is produced in the bone through which the dead bone is coming out is called cloaca. Sinus is a tract epithelium lined by epithelium which connects the interior of the bone to the superficial skin. It's called a sinus. Okay, sinus lined by epithelium. Cloaca is just a hole which is formed in the bone by which through which the dead bone comes out. The new bone formation, new bone is called involucrum. Dead bone is called sequestrum. Okay, so this is a classical picture of sequestra. You see it's serrated. It is yellow in color. Lack blood supply. That pinkish, that the color is lost. It's pure yellow. Paprika sign is negative all those points please read the regular our uh, osteomyelitis recording just for uh, um, mcq sake i am telling you there are several types of sequestrum according to the shape pencil like sequestrum is seen in infants ring sequestrum seen in pin tract infection that is external fixators pin tract infection conical sequestrum is seen in amputation stump coralliform sequestrum is seen in perthes uh, disease According to consistency, coke-like sequestrum in tuberculosis, feathery sequestrum in syphilis, sandy sequestrum in tuberculosis. According to the color, black color, it's fungal or amputation stump, green color, it's pseudomonas. Okay, yes. All these points, very simple, you know. Which type, with uh, respect to tuberculosis of hip, which of the, mar which of the marked area are affected commonly? Okay, in... Uh, 
dissenting artery he is asking mark what are the areas that are affected commonly the tuberculosis hip affects okay this is the roof of the acetabulum this is head of the femur this is greater trochanter this is lesser trochanter four areas are there the most common area affected is always the acetabular roof acetabular roof so here the answer is one so the answer is c answer is c let us see just for your sake i will put my diagram the initial focus of tuberculous lesion in hip starts any of the following in descending order okay the most common area affected is acetabular roof this is the second common area that is epiphysis of the femoral head then metaphysis of the femoral neck this is the area metaphysis of the femoral neck this is called babcock's triangle and the fourth area is greater trochanter and the last thing it is synovium okay so these are the area of affection of tuberculosis of the hip a 30 year old female developed a tumor at the knee joint biopsy image is given below and shows multinucleated osteoclast like giant cell obviously had given the diagnosis what is the most likely condition this is fmg august 2020 question so obviously multinucleated giant cell it should be an osteoclastoma or giant cell tumor only thing what is the closest i want to tell you only one extra point in this slide dear friends what is the closest possible what is the closest possible differential diagnosis for this giant cell tumor multinucleated giant cell exact picture you are able to see here you see okay so multinucleated giant cells we are able to see closest possible diagnosis is aneurysmal bone cyst in aneurysmal bone cyst also exactly you will see multinucleated giant cell like this what is the only difference aneurysmal bone cyst means aneurysm means something with blood vessel which has blood blood has hemoglobin hemoglobin has hemosiderin so when multinucleated giant cell mixed with hemosiderin it is aneurysmal bone cyst you are seeing only multinucleated giant cell no hemosiderin it is giant cell tumor okay yes a patient who had a history of fracture of this right leg came for the following uh, follow-up appointment where his cast was removed for assessment. The doctor found that the area was deformable but not displaceable. Okay. You can, it is bendable but you can't displace it totally. Okay. And thus he reapplied the cast. What stage of fracture healing the patient? So definitely it is going in the stage of soft callus. What are the stages of bone healing? Who gave the stage of bone healing? Sir John Chanley. Sir John Chanley gave the stages of bone healing. Stage of impaction, stage of induction, stage of hematoma formation, stage of soft tissue, soft callus formation, stage of hard callus formation, stages of consolidation. Finally, it is remodeling. These are the stages. When hard callus is formed, it is not deformable, it is not displaceable. In soft callus, the, it is deformable but not displaceable so it is in stage of soft callus okay this is called hunter's staging i repeat once again what is hunter staging sir john hunter hunter staging stage of impaction stage of micro current current induction stage of hematoma formation hematoma is the foundation of callus soft tissue callus soft callus formation hard callus formation consolidation remodeling okay yes what is the x-ray finding seen in patient with fluorosis? Fluorosis obviously causes sclerotic changes. It is osteosclerosis that is seen in fluorosis. Okay. Generalized sclerosis that is seen in fluorosis. I don't know about the other places in our country. In Tamil Nadu they say Dharmapuri and Salem districts highly endemic for fluorosis. This is given in SPM Park and Park. Okay. Fluorosis. You know pretty well fluoride content when it goes above, no, it affects certain organ, mainly teeth and bone. Okay, teeth and discoloration of the teeth and bone. Characteristic X-ray features of fluorosis. The most important thing, three findings one should not forget: generalized osteosclerosis. Number one, ossification of ligaments and tendons. Number two, osteophytosis. What does it mean by in in case of degenerative joint disease, for example? Osteoarthritis of the knee, you can see a hook like thing that's called osteophytes. In fluorosis, no, whole the bone, no, full of osteophytes, that's called osteophytosis, excessive newborn formation, osteophytosis. Fine, last but not the least, ossification of the interosseous membrane of forearm. 
book says that whenever you suspect skeletal fluorosis take an x-ray of the forearm forearm shows ossification of the interosseous membrane diagnosis is concerned is very characteristic you see here this is called osteophytosis you see a lot of osteophytes this is a bone specimen of fluorosis here you see an x-ray of fluorosis of this is a forearm x-ray radius ulna you see here in this area the interosseous membrane is calcified ossification of the interosseous membrane has happened okay so very very pathognomonic or characteristic finding of fluorosis ossification of the interosseous membrane of the forearm yes and a mother with history of breach first risk factor during her pregnancy brings her newborn baby to the opd on examination the doctor notices asymmetric thigh folds in her child with limited abduction of the thigh and gets a click sound on doing so this is called ortholonis test yes or no classically he is giving all the features of congenital dislocation hip otherwise called developmental dysplasia hip breach presentation female child okay and uh, what is that uh, asymmetrical thigh folds click sound when trying to do an abduction internal rotation of the hip gives a click sound that's called ortholonis test and a brace that is shown in the picture is prescribed by the doctor what is the diagnosis what is this brace the diagnosis is congenital dislocation hip there is no second thought very very basic question you should know what is this harness called this brace no this is called pavlik p a v l i k pavlik harness this is called pavlik harness okay it's called a pavlik harness right pavlik harness no this is it is what is that what is the very function it is keep keeping the hip and it prevents further dislocation reduce the hip and fix it in 45 degree flexion 45 degree abduction this is 45 degree abduction flexion 45 degree abduction of the hip this is not total immobilization like a pop cast okay some sort of movement is allowed it's it, it, the child will be happy is possible but it will not allow to the movement to such an extent that hip will get dislocated again so this is called pavlik harness okay pavlik harness one of the very important treatment in early stages of developmental dysplasia hip like your uh, what is that steen steen be steen beaks uh, orthosis which is which is a retainer thing for ctv pavlik harness is a retainer for tdh okay yes a child is unstable to carry supination and pronation movement but it's able to flex his elbow since his childhood his x ray was taken and it shown the below what's the most likely diagnosis okay so you see here the child is able to flex and extend but not able to pronate or supinate when i see the x ray when i see the proximal most part no the this is the radius this is the ulna this has fused into one unit it should be separate but radius and ulna has fused together this is called congenital radio ulnar synostosis one book has written like this unholy alliance of the radius with the ulna okay so this is congenital radio ulnar synostosis this is distal radio ulnar this is uh, proximal radio ulnar here the proximal part they had given radio ulnar stenosis two choices are there distal radio ulnar proximal radio ulnar distal radio ulnar is not united proximal radio ulnar is united so it's proximal radio ulnar synostosis okay so this is very simple and you see this uh, this is an anatomical picture which shows the proximal okay this is the radius and the ulna totally is joined together see our classical x ray this is in our main recording uh, in pediatric orthopedics you see the proximal radio ulnar joint had undergone fusion okay so what you should do you can't do much about that you cut both these okay you just put an incision you just cut both the separate the radius and ulna separate the radius and ulna this is called take down procedure okay this is called take down procedure but the problem is even when you cut and leave again the raw surface area again this may go for re synostosis so for that what they are doing you are cutting and in between you will up, you have to put the fat which is available in the forearm so keep fat in between the fragment which prevents re synostosis that's the thing so this is called a take down procedure so congenital radio ulnar synostosis so 
i think yeah that completes the five year discussion that completes a five year discussion dear friends so thank you for listening i hope uh, this class will help you and most questions again many things i had analyzed again and again repeats are coming so definitely this will be helpful for you i hope many questions will be repeated in the same area and don't worry dear friends all of you all of you will clear don't worry fmg it's a very interesting and uh, exam you will clear all the best for you again i i request from my side if somebody is seeing for the first time please subscribe our channel and you are a regular visitor please if you like it give a like and share it to your friends thank you so much dear friends